really, if you're going to embark on financial freedom, you know, and wealth generation for your family, you need to go in kind of with a cathedral mindset. Um, this is something that I learned from Gino Barbaro at um, Jake and Gino. Like what you build, you may not see the fruit and the end result of, but you're building it for generations. You're building it for your family. You're building it for your heirs. And so and that was such a beautiful concept is that I need to enjoy the journey along the way, not necessarily the end result I, I may or may not get in say five, 10, 15 years. I am Christina Suter and this is the Real Estate Breakthrough Show where we talk about the reality of real estate, the mindset you need in order to face the reality of what it is and tips and tricks to get you moving forward in investing. I am your host, Christina Suter. Hey you, this is Christina Suter with Real Estate Breakthrough and I'm with Whitney Elkins Hutton and she's on her third podcast today. Third? Today? Oh, yeah. Well, no, specifically on StreamYard, but yes, third today. Yeah, on StreamYard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there she is, a podcast pro, so at least a podcast guest pro. And I, I believe I'm supposed to be on your podcast in like two weeks, on like the 14th, I believe. Yeah, we're going to get you on pretty soon here. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. Love it. Love it. Super excited. So today, though, it's all about you. I want to hear about you. So why don't you bottom line your history? Because we were just talking about how you were both an investor of your own, a consultant to investors, and you represent another company. So let's let's work that out. I'm not busy at all, by the way. Guys. No, not at all. <laughs> mm -mm, no. Mm -mm. Well, it, so my journey really starts back in 2002. I bought a house with a significant other and about a month later, the relationship fell apart and I had a house. And, um, you know, so I'm one of those investors by accident type story. So I thought this house was just going to wreck me and I stuffed it full of roommates. And mind you, it had psychedelic daisies painted on the walls, green shag carpet. We're talking like total redo. And, um, got the property put back together over the course of 11 months with help of uh, friends paying them in beer and sushi and pizza yeah and i thought i had to sell the property i thought you know this is going to wreck me i need to get out and when i closed on that property not only did i get a big fat check that was more than what i was making in my day job that had me traveling 80 hours a week sometimes i was like wait a second I'm putting together all my financials for, you know, my tax statement. I'm like, I haven't been paying anything, no principal interest, taxes, insurance. I haven't been paying for the utilities. My roommates have been paying for all that. And like, whoa, hold on. Um, it was really the first realization for me that I could create value in the world. And it was unhooked on how much time I actually spent doing it. And so I was like, okay, maybe. I have I I don't have a degree in real estate, so I can't go buy any more real estate, but I could do this on the side. So I'll just continue to live in flip and house hack and um, did that for several years. And then it I started seeing people around me really create wealth in real estate and retire. I mean, the, our neighbor across the street, like they have th three three rentals in Boulder and they don't work and they just travel. And I'm like, how did you retire off of three rentals? Tell me. And he was like, you know, those flips you've been doing, don't do anymore. Keep them. Put a rent in them and cash flow them. And I was like, that's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? Right. <laughs> so I'm a kind of a ready fire aim type person. So, you know, uh, I, as soon as he said rent them out, you know, I'm trying to buy rentals. I, I get, I scaled to 36 rentals. Now it's not as easy as that. That journey took a few years to do. Um, and then we hit our next ceiling of achievement is now I had 36 rentals and didn't have my time. I'm working and managing rentals or managing the manager on the rentals. Mm -hmm. and so then we started scaling into larger multifamily real estate and then I needed diversification. So we started getting into self storage and express car washes. And so, um, really long, long story short is I love the result that res real estate gives me. Mm -hmm. And I choose to largely play on the passive side of things so I can enjoy my life. So I can go and do what I'm, you know, put on this earth here to do, which I feel is to help create an impact and help people understand how to leverage their best time, their use of their time and attention to, you know, scale their own portfolio. And that's what you do in your consulting work. Yes. 
Yeah, it's honestly, I do more life skills training um, on my consulting side than I do actual like, um, you know, helping somebody say, hey, you should invest in this investment over mm -hmm. another. Like we do a lot of, you know, helping people understand how to leverage their resources, how to leverage their time, how to set priorities, how to create plans. Mm -hmm. um, because majority of the investors I do work with at Ash Wealth actually have all that knowledge they're buried. It's just not organized. Mm -hmm. They have no plan. They have no plan um, to to get them from point A to point B, nor do they have a plan of attack if they did understand that path, that mm -hmm. journey from A to B. Uh, so we really help them, you know, uncover those obstacles and eliminate them along the way. There are a lot more investors out there, I think, than the field is aware of, where it's like, well, you know, I have a plan and I'm implementing it. And we all like to sound like we know what we're doing, right? But at the same time, I've run across a lot of people who are like, uh, could you talk with me quietly and privately about what maybe I could be doing better? Maybe there's something I could be doing that's better in getting to my end result. Or I see there's a hole in my plan. I don't know what to do with it. I don't really know where I'm going. I just know I've been buying properties for 10 years. And there's all of these sort of medium points of like, yeah, I'm an investor and... What value would I have? What clarity, what confidence would I be, be, be experiencing if I was willing to get somebody else in there to really just spend that time to go, okay, here's where you are. Here's where you say you want to go. Go. Here's your goals. Now, how do you want to get there? What's the life you want to live? And what are the leadership skills or management skills you need to get into hitting that end target in a way that's calm, clear, and feels like you know that you're on purpose in your life? I love it. Well said. <laughs> That's what I try to do with my clients too. So it's like, I, I know that, I know that archway. And then of course I stay with my clients and I help them implement the plan like a quarterback. I do sort of quarterback the team to help mm -hmm. them implement it. So I stay with them through that. But I think it's really important that what you've talked about is it's, it's life skills and mass self mastery skills. That is really more of the bottom line that makes them a successful investor than just knowing how to do diligence on the deal. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think I attribute this to how we are trained growing up as we're trained to go to school, get a good job, invest in our IRA, uh, retirement accounts, and, you know, largely invest in Wall Street. And if we do that, we hand our money over to somebody else and we're taught to invest in a ticker or a mutual fund and pick that mutual fund up based off the best returns. Sure, you might have a little bit of diversification, you know, between mutual funds and within the fund itself. But you know, the the skill that gets skipped over here is um, somebody, you know, one being empowered to do this for themselves. And two, if they do decide, hey, I don't like Wall Street, I want to get off this casino ride, this roller coaster, I want to go into real estate, they start looking at the deal itself. What are the numbers the deal produces for them? Mm -hmm. But that, you know, if you're looking, if you're investing in somebody else's business, that any person can put together a great offering memorandum that's a marketing document mm -hmm. and people get enamored by numbers. We really need to back it up and really understand, do you holistically understand your goals, risk, and your timeline? Do you have an investment thesis put together, either based, you know, something that you've researched that you're moving forward with, or maybe you've been investing for a while and you've learned, I don't want to do X type of deal. Great. Mm -hmm. Let's build that thesis. And then let's go find those operators, those business jockeys, so to speak, to invest in. Because really, I mean, even the past 12 to 24 months have taught us we need to invest with operators, even if they're experienced turbulence in their business, that can get that investment across the finish line. Yeah. And, and yeah, getting the investment across the finish line is sort of the operative word and the real like structure, the real heralding call, the real herald, heralding call in today's, in today's world of like, okay, can you get it across the finish line? Cause I'm an investor. I'm passive. There's 35 of us. There's a hundred of us. There's, you know, however many of us, no one of us is solving this problem. You are the one who's solving the problem. You, the syndicator is the one solving the problem. And how are you going to do that? And it, it is about problem solving. It's no longer about your capacity to do due diligence. It's no longer about, you know, your capacity to add 
It is now about your capacity to be honest about what's happening so that you can do an assessment authentically about what's happening and then come up with a plan that actually has a solution in it that your investors can have faith in. Every one of those things I just said is hard by itself. Any one of those four steps is hard by itself. And especially keeping investors faith is hard. Absolutely. Yeah. We call it the no love and trust triangle or no like and trust trust triangle. I always substitute like for love because I, I mean, that's me. Like, I don't want to just like something. Um, I'm constantly it. telling my daughter, like we go shopping and she goes, oh, I kind of like that. I'm like, don't buy it unless you love it. Yeah. Like, because if you like it, it'll sit in your closet like yeah. half the year. It'd be fun. Love it. It'd be a fun concept, but you got to love it. You got to love it, right? And then you'll be like, man, that was money well spent. <laughs> so why why did you transition over to real estate? So you had a J-O-B, right? You were, you were investing, flipping, right? But then you made the choice to move into a field that isn't always flat and, and, you know, and easy. It is predictable, but it's not always flat and easy. And you, you made that choice. So there was something in you that was called to make that choice. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was almost kind of like a siren song. Originally, when I got over into real estate, I wanted to hit rep status. I mean, that was kind of the allure. I I thought I wanted to be that general partner that raised on multiple projects and, you know, took charge of investor capital. And guess what? I'm good at it. I am great at it. Yeah. I and mean, that's what you but do for your day sure. job. Right? What you do for your day job is you deal with investors, right? Yes. Yes. So go ahead. Um, but just because you're great at something doesn't mean that's, um, just because you have a skill doesn't mean that it's your passion. Yeah. And so I had to, um, you know, take a really a, kind of a hard look during COVID. And that was kind of the, the crossroads for me at the time I was, um, in a general partnership, I was the minority partner and we were scaling this company and COVID really, you know, highlighted, um, you know, our path forward for the, the partnership. And, you know, for me, being a very driven person, I'm all about, like, let's let's crush this problem. Let's move forward. At the same time, my daughter is at home. She's schooling from home. We have this freedom that where we can travel more. And I'm like, wait a second. These are all the things that we said we wanted for our family 10 years from now. It's here today. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I have a hard choice to make. Do I stay connected to this drive? And why do I have this drive or do I, you know, step into what I say is what I truly want for myself and my family. And so I consider everything an experiment and I reserve the right to change my mind. So yes, yes, we I stepped see. into this experiment and, you know, during COVID, you know, we, we've done an incredible amount of traveling um, to the point where I'm actually kind of like, do we have to travel more? Can we <laughs> like stay home? <laughs> So uh, we've done a lot of traveling. My daughter, she goes back to school full time, you know, next year. But it was it was such a season that, and a blessing that we were given. Mm -hmm. But you, just because you can have anything doesn't mean you can have everything. So I did have to, if I said yes to, you know, what we wanted for our family meant um, I needed to realistically say no to um, scaling that side of the business with these two other partners. So I stepped back. Okay. Now, Christina, I, 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 I'm going to go back and answer the question directly. Okay. In that moment, I realized what I loved actually doing wasn't chasing the raise number, working nights and weekends. What I loved doing was just talking to investors and helping them understand and coach them and mentor them to bust through that obstacle. Every single call I was on, I would uncover an obstacle that was keeping somebody from making a decision for themselves. And that is what I love doing. And that is, you know, just fed into my passion with Ash Wealth. It's fed into my passion with writing the book Money for Tomorrow as well. Yes. Let's talk about your book since you're right on top of it. So let's talk about why write the book Money for Tomorrow. What was it you were hoping to achieve in writing that book? Well, I actually had started the book over the course of, you know, several years. And I wouldn't even say I started the book. I had a document that I was, you know, kind of typing out all my lessons and learning. Mm -hmm. And I was keeping that document for my daughter. Oh. Plain and simple, the backbone of Money for Tomorrow was if I got hit by a bus, my daughter would have this document. My family would have this document because I thought it was such a shame that my grandfather, when he scaled his, um, you know, wealth in oil and cattle, that he 
um, unbeknownst to the family that we didn't know that he'd written anything. And years later, it was uncovered that he'd written a journal, but it never ended up into our hands mm -hmm. to where we could do anything about it. So I didn't want that to happen for my family. So that's why I wrote it. But then when I'm starting to coach and mentor investors, I keep pulling from concepts in this document. And I'm mm -hmm. like, why don't, why isn't this just out in the world? Mm -hmm. Like if I have a blueprint, blueprint and plan that is working for people, you know, why not give it to the masses? So, so who should read your book? There are, well, anybody that's an investor. Okay. Anybody that wants to invest, I think should read the book. Anybody who wants generational wealth for their family should read the book. Okay. Now, uh, people who are starting off, this is going to be the blueprint you know, to get you like 85, 90% of the way there. Okay. You know, if you're looking for a plan, this is a plan that you can work from and borrow and tweak along the way. If you've already scaled your portfolio in some form or fashion, go back and read the book because I guarantee you, you know, that there are things that you don't have buttoned up in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Most investors I know are great at creating wealth in their day jobs or in their businesses. They get pretty decent at growing wealth. Where they lack is how to keep wealth and how to pass it on. And so those are all, mm -hmm. those are four different skill set. And so what we teach all different skills, all four are those skill sets in the book. This is, that's so well delineated. It really is. Cause I mean, I think people talk, focus on one of those build the wealth or they focus on keep the wealth and they are different mindsets and they are different approaches, but they do both belong inside of a portfolio. And the way that I focus on achieving that is I create an allotment schedule where the job of that dollar is to grow or the job of that dollar is to preserve on. Right. And so I have like, like I, I literally, I literally go, what's the job of this money? <laughs> like, like this mm -hmm. money has, a, it's not about money. It's about assigning jobs. Right. And so the job of this money is to fulfill, you know, this dynamic or that dynamic. And I, I love that you laid all four of those out so clearly. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, in that, you know, if there's one thing that any investor in today's market, you know, uh, and I get, I, I should preface this. I'm always asked, by seasons and investors, what is one thing that I can do in order to get ahead in today's market? And they always think I'm going to give them an investment. The next hot asset class, <laughs> the, the next stock tip, like, you know, I had one investor pumping me for information. If you had $2 million, how would you allocate this portfolio knowing what you know today? And um, I always bring it back. Are you tracking your portfolio appropriately? Are you tracking all your income and expenses? Do you have a job for every dollar? Do you know if it's creating wealth for you, protecting your wealth? Is it just a lifestyle expense or is it actually destructive? Like, do you have those jobs assigned? Are you um, filling in, you know, the holes in your financial moat? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, understanding the six different ways you can, your wealth is evaporating, and, you know, right in front of your eyes. Most investors don't realize that. So again, like, it's really about like, are you, keeping track of your portfolio and really fully understanding what's happening there because that is the one big hot tip if there's a tip that i can give people today yeah. is go back and make sure that you have all the everything buttoned up i do it every single year and it's so maddening i mean i'm a pro at this myself and yeah. it's so maddening you know how many thousands of dollars i uncover i'm like I could have put this towards my investments, <laughs> well, but it's okay. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. I just wanted to, I wanted to say something, but I can hold what I'm going to say. If there's more you want to say. No, go for it. No, I just, it, it's, um, I think of, of wealth as tracking your wealth as being almost the same as like tracking your partner. You know how, when you're married, right? When you're married, if you sit there and go, sorry, husband, I don't care when you get home from work. I don't care when da, da, da. Like, I'm not going to pay any attention to your schedule. I'm only going to pay attention to my schedule. How well is that marriage going to do? Right. Whether it's their schedule, whether it's their food needs, whether it's like, how well is that relationship going to do? Will it continue to stay together or will it potentially start to drift a little further apart? And maybe that's what you want. And then maybe that's great. But at the same time, how much do you want your partner to track your schedule? What do you mean you just planned another meeting when you know you're supposed to take care of the kids tonight? 
Would you be pissed about that? Would that be like, right? Let's just say like, if nothing else you have to get. So when you ignore your finances and you don't track it, it's like ignoring a major partner schedule, right? It's not being intimate to what's one of your longest relationships in your life, which is to your money. Right. Ooh, I love that. So if you choose, well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, well, and to stack on top of that. Now, if you want to grow your wealth, you're ignoring your relationship. And then all of a sudden, Hey, I want you to show up for that fancy dinner at 6 PM on Saturday, like fully dressed. Like, come on, let's go. Like that's a tough call, right? Yeah. That's a tough asking something to perform that you're not in relationship with is actually difficult. And so it's people have this concept that they're bad at money or they have this concept that they're bad at tracking or they're bad at, and it's like, well, don't you track your children's schedule? Don't you track your husband's schedule? Don't you track your wife's schedule? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but would you do better if you did? Well, then why don't you track your money schedule? And it just, it's just, it's a way I hope of demystifying and taking off some of the negative, because it's really about negative conversations we've had in our past. Somebody said you were bad at, somebody said you couldn't, somebody said, or you said, I'm bad at, or I can't, right? And then now you just don't do it. I know I'm guilty of that. I know, I know I've been guilty of that, right? So it's just, so what in your history you feel like prepared you for being able to really go into this? I know I said, we talk about both you know, passiveinvesting.com and Ash Wealth, but we're obviously going deep into Ash Wealth. So what is it in your history that you think that prepared you the best for, for doing your consulting work in Ash Wealth and the book? Because it's not just a finance thing. It's not just a master's or bachelor's degree in blank, right? It's dynamic. You know, uh, that is such an interesting question because, you know, even just coaching and mentoring in real estate was you know, originally not my intent. I was scaling the portfolio for myself. And it was, uh, I got, a, landed a podcast on biggerpockets.com several years ago, and they wanted to talk about how I scaled my portfolio. And when that podcast came out, every, all these people came out of the woodwork and I'm like, I have to serve them. I'm like, okay. So it's, you know, for me, I think, did I intend to do this? No, mm -hmm. but the opportunity presented itself and I decided that I needed to seize it. I've always been in service of others, you know, throughout my entire career. You know, I come, I grew up in the medical field. I went to school for public health. Um, it's always been about, you know, serving others and empowering communities. And I always thought it would come from a health perspective. And, uh, you know, if I have to, you know, kind of, you know, tie a through line together, you know, financial incapacity, what we see in the world, people abdicating their, um, you know, their financial decisions to other people, not taking control of their wealth. I mean, at the end of the day, that is, you, you could equate that to a public health crisis, mm. you know, uh, and, you know, if you really want to have true ownership of your life, which is what public health is, the ultimate goal of public health is to get empower communities, you have to take that over for yourself all those decisions. That's so beautifully correlated. I've never thought about that, that impact, but you're correct. The not tracking of your money, the not taking financial leadership in your life allows for or creates not having financial leadership in your life. And if you don't have financial leadership in your life, guess who's living your life? Somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, some other decision, some job, some employer, some mate, some child, some whatever, but something else is running your life. If you're not choosing financial independence, then you just don't get it. You just don't get to have financial independence if you don't choose it. And that is, that is a crisis. It is. And here's the thing, not everybody, you know, will, can everybody achieve their goal? Absolutely. Yes. But everybody's going to be on some part of that journey. And I think that's the other half of the problem is in our society, we, it's either on or off. You're, you got a thumbs up, you know, there, there's always a result we're looking for. You know, um, maybe you, I have a child, you know, she's 11 years old. I take a picture. It's mom. Can I see it now? We used to have to wait for things, right? Yeah, right. It was instant gratification. Um, you know, 
I think that's the other part of the, the, the issue here is people do start off on, you know, trying to achieve financial stability, vitality, independence from themselves, even financial freedom, but they get dismayed along the way because it didn't come quick enough. It didn't come mm-hmm. as simple enough. And, you know, really, if you're going to embark on financial freedom, you know, and wealth generation for your family, you need to go in kind of with a cathedral mindset. Um, this is something that I learned from Gino Barbaro at um, Jake and Gino. Like, mm-hmm. What you build, you may not see the fruit and the end result of, but you're building it for generations. You're building it for your family. You're building it for your heirs. And so and that was such a beautiful concept is that I need to enjoy the journey along the way, not necessarily the end result I I may or may not get in, say, 5, 10, 15 years. So well said. And it, it really is because it's just it's so much it's th- threaded through all the data right if your parents paid attention to money and they left you even the smallest amount so that, or they helped you buy your first home right helped you get through college even if it's a community college if they supported you if they they poured into you then you've created a more successful person on this planet and this is just kind of like I don't want to judge one way or the other. I'm just saying we've noticed in the data, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also about, you know, not necessarily having somebody pour into you, but did they pass along the skills, the mindset, the beliefs of why they did that, Mm. right? Because that is the disconnect. I mean, you know, um, you know, I I have heard countless stories, especially when I was working in the public, public health field, um, of moms working, you know, single moms working two or three jobs, putting, helping put their kids through college. They didn't have a penny to rub together, mm-hmm. but they passed along that mindset, that worth that mm-hmm. good, ethic, that belief. And then what was the next generation able to do? They were able to scale and build, right? So it, it doesn't have to, you know, it's helpful if you have money to start your journey, but even just having that hustle and that work, work ethic to try to figure it out, the hand, the how can I attitude, that is going to be so immensely helpful too. Conversely, if you just hand over, if you've got millions and millions of dollars and you just hand it over to the next generation with no mindset training, no beliefs, no values being translated there, you know, the exact opposite can happen. That wealth could disappear within a generation or two. Yes. And I think it's something like 40% fall off the millionaire list every year. So there's something about being able to sustain money, right? We're back to the concept of sustaining money. And it's, it is in the financial literacy and the financial commitment that allows money to be sustained. It's not completely in that control only because we know cycles come and go. We know that, that, you know, we're in one right now that hits happen, unintended, unintended events, but at the same time being willing being willing to be in the conversation. So we're back to the beginning of our, of our, of our statement. But I think um, I'm just reflecting back on, like you said, like how many people of wealth spend their time developing their wealth and not spend their time with, Hey, let's talk about values, wherever that values conversation happens, right? Maybe it happens in the car drive. Maybe it happens over dinner. Maybe it happens when you're tucking them into bed. Maybe it happens when you see them on the weekends, but having that conversation translate, and it can be kind of, scary or complicated to have that conversation. I think sometimes the conversation happens as you should be a blank, blank, blank. And that's the conversation. It's like, well, it isn't really passing along the values. It's passing along what you think, right? Mm -hmm. Versus passing along the, you should be blank, 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 because it will help blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. A thought. Well, there's even, I think, another approach that I like, and you know, to borrow some tell concept. Me, tell me. I love yeah, it. Yeah, Jim Shields' work with um, the family board meeting. I don't know if you've, you know, you know, read his book. Guys, amazing website. So, you know, if you're looking to, you know, how to educate your kids and wondering what is not being taught in schools, just go to his website, jimshields.com, and you know, there's, you know. He has a checklist around financial education, um, life skills, you know, negotiation, you know, communication, stuff like that, and um, uh, personal development. So that's a great checklist. But one of the things he says is uh, don't should all over the place. Nobody likes shoulds. Um, 
don't shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's good all over the place. Exactly. Yes. Rather, this once you need to embody the concept as if that is your family. Like, who do you want to be? Mm -hmm. That's not who the Huttons are. The Huttons do this. Right. Right. It's kind of like the the affirmation statements. I am X, right? I am right. Y. And so, you know, if you're trying to teach like the next generation, uh, your kids something and they do something counter counterintuitive to what you want to have taught, yes, you can come at it didactically, or you could be like, that's just not who we are. Mm. The Huttons, we do this. Mm -hmm. Right. So now you're tying it to an identity. Now you got to be really careful when you tie, tie to the identity because yeah. you want the positive there and you want to push out the negative, right? Right, so. right, 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 right. Yeah, that is difficult. And again, it, it is about, I think it's delivery timing and, and delivery. And I, you know, we're now into parenting conversations, I'm afraid, instead of into, uh, instead of, but at the same time, um, when you're talking about moving wealth forward, it is a parenting conversation. It's not just the wealth, it's passing forward the values, right? If you want, like you said, yeah, because I mean, some people, you know, that are scaling their wealth and they want to pass on a large estate, right? Mm -hmm. Other people want to scale their large, their large wealth and, and they are going to go with the uh, Bill Perkins concept, die with zero. <laughs> and so what are they passing along? They're passing along that knowledge, uh, the values, the traditions. Okay. And, you know, again, that is just as valuable as the money sometimes. And so, um, again, that kind of circles back, like, why did I, you know, um, have the book? Like, uh, if I like was a total jerk with my investing and lost it all, right? Like, you know, I, I had the concepts in place to, to teach my daughter on how to scale it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, if I violated my own rules for whatever reason, you know, you know, that's, that's not my intent. You know, she would know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it is, I think, what you try to give along to your clients, right, to your consulting work. And you do work you do work for another company, but you work inside of customer relations, I believe. So it's very similar in some, in some ways. Yeah, so my work with Ash Wealth is, you know, working one-on-one -on -one, um, or in a group setting with um, investors who are just starting off or in their journey or um, have scaled a little bit and they're like, Ooh, I've hit an, you know, obstacles and I need to like, you know, pivot the portfolio. Um, my work at passiveinvesting.com is really about connecting investors to actual investments. Somebody mm -hmm. who has their, their goals and the risks and the timeline figured out, they got their investment thesis. They just need the investments now. Um, how can I just diversify my portfolio across multifamily self-storage express car washes and real estate debt? See, it's, it's, Again, those go hand in hand, but at the same time, having that, you must run into people when you're talking to them in the impassive vesting, where we've noticed, and we've talked about this before, where they have an idea of why they're investing, but they don't necessarily have a clear plan as to what it is that will get them from point A to point B and get them to where they really want to go. And being able to use passive investing can be an important part of that plan. So you must be educating people often on why passive investing, which is the name of the website, is, is, right? Why passive investing is so powerful inside of a portfolio. Absolutely. Yeah. We at passiveinvesting.com, we have um, a ton of resources there. Uh, you know, our, we do our passive investing made simple masterclass, which is weekly education. We just kind of, you know, dive into all topics related to passive, you know, passive investing, asset classes, markets, self-directed IRAs, tax, legal, you name it. Um, then we also do our monthly skill building boot camps, which all of this is on YouTube and it's all free education. And so in those skill building boot camps, I take people through the course of a year, you know, logistically, like, you know, how can they on their own set their goals, risk and timeline? understand how to vet operators, markets, and deals, and then track their portfolio. Sometimes people, they see that and they're like, it would be really nice if somebody like helped build that with me. Right. So, exactly. uh, but that's a great, that, those are great resources for people to start with. I think it's important that, that I'm going to repeat it, passivenesting.com because having resources, I'm two things in my mind that you need to be successful in real estate. And it's not, it's not starting with a million dollars. It is, being able to educate yourself and being able to have a network, right? Those are the two things that will make a big difference um, one way or the other. And I, I, education is so free now. I mean, it used to be 
The only way to find out about real estate when I was young was to take a class or to buy a book. And that was it. Like that was what was available. There wasn't this amazing depth of YouTube university available. And now there is, right? And you, you're adding to that depth of YouTube university. And it's, it's something I think that a lot of investment companies do, as well as people who've been long timers in the industry are drawn to teach, to paying it forward, to teaching it forward and being able to pay it forward. And, you know, it, it's satisfying for us as instructors, right? Like I'm a consultant like you are, I'm an educator and right? I have my own classwork, um, which I do through ITI. You know, I have my own podcast. I have, you know, I do my own reels and all of it is about educating, right? Being able to share what I've learned and really feeling like I'm, I, I it's like, I, I try to think of it as my family out there, my extended family, the family that, you know, my great, great cousins, my great, great nieces, like people out there that I want to thrive, people out there who I want to grow and being able to get that education out there to them. And it's, it feels satisfying to pay it forward. And that's what education, that's why so much education I think is available on YouTube. And of course there is, you get to be no, no like, and trust, right? People get to check Whitney out based on this podcast and what it is and who you are, where you come from in your consulting work and why they want to be closer to you as a human being. Absolutely. And I'm all the time telling people, you know, make sure, trust, but verify, double check your resources, right? Um, there's a lot of great free education out there. There's also a lot of not so great education out there. <laughs> You yeah. know, that might take you down the wrong path. So you yeah. still have to be very discerning, you know, and that that's just the world we live in, you know, this very interconnected world. That's just the world we live in. But yes. same same rules apply. Trust, but verify in the space as well. All right, Whitney, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? Absolutely. Yeah. If you're you know looking for investment specifically in multifamily self-storage and express car washes, you can reach out to me at PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. We also do real estate debt there as well. Um, and then if you're somebody who, you know, needs more one-on-one -on -one type work, wants a blueprint, you can check me out uh, at uh, ashwealth.com or check out the book Money for Tomorrow. So beautifully said. Whitney, thank you so much for, for doing this, for being, I've been, Whitney and I have been talking, well, we haven't been talking for a year, but we talked about this over a year ago of getting you on my podcast. And then I ran into you again. You're like, hey, what about that box? And I went, you know what? That's right. Let's do it. Let's get it done. And I didn't realize how akin you and I are until we started hanging out more at the best ever conference. And I went, oh, that's why. Right. You have plenty of amazing conversations there. So plenty of so amazing fun. conversations. Thank you so much, Whitney, for being on my on my podcast, ashwealth.com, passiveinvesting.com. Tune in in two weeks for your next podcast installment. I, of course, am on Real Estate Breakthrough uh, YouTube, also Christina Suter uh, YouTube. There's ChristinaSuter.com, but there's also iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify, and Amazon TV and Roku TV. So you can find this on lots and lots of different spaces. So you have no excuse as to tell me why you're not educated. We have lots and lots of free information for you in order for you to succeed in fulfilling your life's purpose using real estate. Christina Suter.